Um, I've noticed a lot of people are writing how to write poem poems. So this is my how to write a poem poem. And it's called Making Miniature Gnomes from Laundry Receipts. Start with flowers, plants whose names you cannot pronounce. Greenery shaming your history of phonics because teachers wanted you to have shortcuts as much as they wanted you to be self-sufficient. Maybe I'm the only one ashamed. Mention the weather if it ruined your hair or your boots, but not if it changed your plans or gave you unpleasant thoughts about Catholic school. Your roommate, the bartender, the boy on the bike, the thrift store, your culinary skills, your father, his father, or pension. Blend and drink something you wouldn't expect to be swallowed. Feel somebody up. Don't touch his hands, hips, or eyelids. Make a one-line stanza. <coughs> Tell the truth at least once, even if it is a truth for everybody. Describe someone you loved, or still love, or would love, if you were stronger, bolder, or God. Pray. Take a few moments to open the mail. Respond to the collections agency explaining your lack of funds, then write a check to Second Harvest. Revise and edit, removing every unnecessary that. Take a rotary dial telephone to the cemetery and call your mother. Leave a message. You can blame your dreams on her if you mean it. You can thank her for those dreams too, but you must mean it. Lie down in three different places. None of them can be your own home. One suggestion might be the front lawn of the girl who wants you dead. Another might be the fire escape of the office building where you sailed confidential paper airplanes. Or the countertop of the diner where your lover flips pancakes Saturday mornings. Write seven cliches very quickly. Run, skip, or walk around the block, repeating each phrase four times. Revise and edit. Remove the names you aren't ready to name and the things you aren't ready to ask of them. Write your name backwards in the sand. Put a heart next to it and nothing else. I always wish I had better like inter interpoem banter. <laughs> so you know, before before coming here, I was like, okay, think about things I can tell people about these poems. And this is kind of the only poem I can tell you something about. Um, and, and that is that the title came from a fortune in a fortune cookie. And it's one of those things that just felt really right for the poem, but otherwise it made me angry when I opened up the fortune cookie and I was like, this is my fortune. <laughs> so anyway, the universe is the stage on which you dance, guided by your heart. <laughs> the two inch tall thrift shop music box ballerina looked like a whore I worked the Northwest Third and Ankeny block with my first few weeks in town, before I got clean, before I stopped shaking enough to find God in picking locks and leaving prayer books in top dresser drawers in place of collectible pennies and heirloom peridots, unburdening the owners of empty idols, unleashing harnesses of familial history, missing her right Russian third position raised arm, her face worn like some little girl wanted luck before each recital and must have needed it or must have danced daily for years, her little tool too too dirty, torn, showing where the plastic peach leotard met the plastic peach thigh. She tried to twirl. The spring that held her toes together slightly bent, her two-inch frame becoming more and more like us women and wannabe women of Northwest Third and Ankeny, ready to celebrate a carnival any day we found enough coal or petals to paint our faces dancing any time we were not pressed with our backs against bricks and stained by the hour motel room sheets. The queen of us whores needing no orchestra to raise herself on releve, on black and callous balls of her feet, a dull emergency exit sign shining red on her worn face, <coughs> teasing the frizz of the hair not kept in the bun, matted at the crown as she, up her head as she took to the littered stage for a nightly performance the rat performing the swan, gyrating and seizing instead of sashaying and pirouetting until a businessman, bored, passed by wanting to recreate Degas the interior and take our deranged ballerina against a wall or on dirty bedding. 
I took all two inches home in my pocket, leaving the music locked in another drawer of the box for someone who loved the symphony, but not the ballet. I needed the second hand charm between my thumb and forefinger and icon to keep my hands idle. Crushing the wedding of my February to September lover of 1998. I couldn't unlatch the fence's lock, but I would make myself a witness still. The front door security was replaced with ceremony and the hinges made no protest to my pressure. Let me pass into the kitchen where I found someone's grandmother holding a blue jay in her lap, mumbling last rites as she took wedding cake poppy seeds she'd softened in her mouth to the chipped beak. She let me sit at her feet. She closed my eyelids with her fingertips. She called me by the name God gave me on my second deathbed after six vertebrae cracked because my spine was not stronger than asphalt, because there was never room enough on the seat of that bike for you and me and the way your body moved when you saw any gray Honda and got thinking about that girl who left you in a Las Vegas parking lot when you were old enough to know better. She placed seven seeds inside my lower lip, told me to sing until they sprouted when bees would come taking the notes from my throat now filled with roots and make an orchestral excuse on my behalf. Make honey that would turn sweetened cups of tea into the hemlock or the castor oil, but either way, I would not be the bride. Sparring, or a good day to remember I have I am back at Al Moreland's, blistering my knuckles beneath blood-stiffened leather gloves while Coach reads in his preacher rasp from a book of bad tear I'd left in my locker. He's taunting me with Marvin Gaye, stats on the kids he'd saved from the streets these nine years since I gave up, and the crucifix he'd found mingling with French philosophy and these worn mittens. The cross my first real boyfriend clasped around my neck the afternoon, he decided I wasn't as good at sex as he thought Magdalena Mariana Lazaga Becerra Galeano might be. <laughs> the evening, I decided I would not sleep in Milwaukee County another night because someone else thought my body was useless, and I didn't know how else to prove him wrong. I am back at Al Moreland's because yesterday something in my posture over the punch bowl made you certain you should put your arms around me. Inconvenient friend, what was my spine telling you? And something in your fingers on my scapula made me anxious for one sincere gesture, a touch as meaningful as the entire motion of a left hook. From cocking the elbow to leaving microscopic autobiographies of my misinterpretations on the surface of whatever structure is made to absorb the kinesis of my embarrassing belief in words. You walked with me around the reception hall, betting your firstborn daughter I would not cover the wooden car carving of William Burroughs in drag with my Argyle stocking, arguing you were father enough to decline a dare to pour your warmed old style into the piss pouffant below a hollowed real gone Tom Waits, knighting a circa 1997 Isaac Brock. You slipped obsequious ice cubes into my tonic, called me hateful when several glasses hadn't made me drunk, couldn't let you kneel beside me as I pled with Saints Tom and Isaac for a synesthetic experience. But it wasn't really such a bad day. I felt my feet for the first time since you Prince charmed them into these troubadours boots and for once you maybe didn't quite let me down. Or at least I made good use of your back, made ladder rungs of your ribs and remembered what it was to walk away. does not have a title, so if you think of anything <coughs> through the course of it, you should write it down and let me know afterwards, and I'd be really appreciative. It sounded like teeth tearing through gums, then it sounded like tendons peeling back from bone. There was wind through branches and wet hair. There was paper ripping, 
Faustina Bordoni's trachea on the spigot where restless women made pilgrimage to drink water until they died. Two palms from any two hands rubbed together until the heat ironed out wrinkles on the bridesmaid's petticoat and she could be a good servant again. Then it sounded like a woman crying in the dry porcelain bathtub on the second anniversary of the day she fractured her right ankle and a nurse who meant well gave her a knowing look when all she knew was physiology. This is a different sound from the sound of a young woman crying in her lover's closet as he buckles his belt after telling her his wife is coming home. I read your poem, cut out the phrases that made my lips swollen, and I swallowed them. I heard this somewhere. I repeated it until I did not recognize my voice, and I repeated it until the voice I heard was mine. I heard this somewhere, and then I heard nothing at all. <coughs> For those of you who were at Billy Collins' reading, I did not know if he was saying it is a good or bad thing to warn people that you are reading a poem that has parts, um, but he mentioned something about that. And this only has four parts, so it's not like a thousand parts. You should like <laughs> run and take like a ten minute break. It won't be that bad. Places quite hostile to romance. One. Rauli bombs his heart over everything. Cement barriers around La Boca houses where brothers pepper their loco with debris from the shoes of the one who works the night shift at the grocery store. Soupte cars shuffling tourists from Café des Arts to the Holiday Inn during daylight. Aluminum siding surrounding green spaces with promises the parks are under construction and warnings to keep out until then. At the bend between sidewalk and brick wall near the edge of Palermo on the way to nowhere, he tagged a structure with the anatomical accuracy of a med school textbook 50 years before its time this heart was complete. A mother crying, a masked man with a spray can like a weapon pointed at the pulmonary valve and a replica of someone who could be me. Dead but smiling in the left atrium. Two. The back bathroom in the tin box is designated for couples especially. Rules of decorum are posted outside the door, inside a 10 minute shot clock, a toilet, a trash can, a rug pretending to be fur, I have been here before. A man at my back, a man not interested in calling any of the numbers written around the baseboards, a man apparently not interested in having a good time. Three. Six Saturday nights I've spent in the Main Street Walgreens, but it only takes three to understand the script. Between two and five under 40 men come in for condoms, less than two purchase any. One middle-aged man buys KY, a liter of Coke Zero, saltines, and one cosmetic product in some shade of lilac. One woman who looks like she's been crying a few weeks longer than I've been alive tries on sunglasses with non-black frames polishes each fingernail with a different non-red paint, addresses several eight and a half by 12 inch bubble mailers to literary characters with their author's addresses for returns, fills out one crossword puzzle, and buys two packs of tea lights and a box of matches. Two to three groups of three to six teenage girls stand at the end of aisle eight and play truth or dare. Someone calls a boy. Someone has to buy tampons, someone starts crying. Someone tries to steal a pack of gum but throws it out of her pocket before she passes the door's sensors. Someone starts crying. Four. I have to flirt with the doorman to get us to the rooftop terrace of the building next door. I will ask later if it is worth it. At seven floors up, we are more voyeurs than astronomers, but we are used to renaming ourselves. I will ask later if it is worth it. I tell you, I don't know how to find Orion, and I can't remember why I am supposed to care about the stars, about the myth. I tell you, some nights I can see Mrs. 16F dancing with a cardboard cutout. She dresses for the occasion, but I cannot see who she holds. I tell you about the books I am reading, the songs I cannot get out of my head, the patterns I will pass and appropriately interpret when I am ready anything, to keep from asking if you can remember why you came here. 